with a panel presentation on the Youth Employment and Empowerment Project for Gang-Affected Youth. Those of you who are there or listening remember especially the insights and intellect displayed by the young man who had redirected his source of self-esteem from his gang to his workplace. I think we'll learn today about how to tap the talents and potential of youths in another innovative project. Straight Shooting was the brainchild of Eric Fishman and Rita Torino Flynn, and they're here today with Robert Monterosa, one of the photographers, to present the project. As you'll hear, a public-private partnership between the Oregon Community Children and Youth Services Commission and local businesses, Trailblazers, Portland Community College, Portland Art Museum, Christian Picture Frame and Gallery, Wyden and Kennedy, U.S. West, The Oregonian, and The Resort at the Mountain, and dozens of volunteer mentors who collaborated to put cameras in the hands of gang-affected youth, coach them in their use, and display the results at the Portland Art Museum and here today in the lobby. We'll hear more about this project from one of the photographers, Robert Monterosa from Eloa. He's an artist with his own airbrush t-shirt business, and he'll explain what he learned from this project and how participating in straight shooting affected his life. Also, Rita Trevino Flynn and Eric Fishman will explain how they helped organize the project and how others can follow their lead. Eric Fishman is no stranger to City Club or to anyone who read about him in this week's Oregonian. It won't surprise you to learn how he used his enterprising skills in this project. Rita Trevino Flynn is a highly experienced and honored national journalist, also a familiar face to uh, Oregonians' OPB viewers who watched her on Inside Oregon. She now applies her talents as communications manager for the Oregon Community Children and Youth Services Commission. Please join me in welcoming to the podium, first, Robert Monterosa, then Rita Flynn and Eric Fishman. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I have been asked to give a speech about what is being, how can I say this, but um, just being an ex-gang member trying to go straight. Um, I'm the oldest out of five, four brothers and one sister. For the past eight years, I've been trying to fight getting out of gangs, and also I thought at the beginning was school, but I learned the hard way that it was, oh, I was making a big mistake. Um, I don't know how, you know, I got my reputation when I came up here to Oregon. I've been living here almost five years now. And everywhere I go, people know me. And, you know, it's strange. I have never been, you know, been so respected before. I didn't even expect this from just a name. But I thank God, you know, has, you know, put up with me for so long. I've been so close to, you know, not existing anymore that it scares me all the time. You know, and I joined this program because it actually was kind of, a, of an accident. I, w I wanted to be a counselor for little kids, and I met Deputy David Lyle, who works with Washington County, and he referred me to Deputy Voltal, and Deputy Voltal had me fill out a questionnaire and I got a phone call from him saying that there was a photo project that was gonna be held for three and a half months and that if I was interested and I said yes, that would be no problem, but I still thought I was gonna be a counselor for younger kids. Once I got there, I missed my first two meetings. The first one, I completely forgot about it and the second one, I was put in jail for the weekend. I was driving for a friend that was drunk and but the officer, you know, the thing, he must have been a newcomer or something, and he just wanted to push us around. And he didn't want to hear anything, so he just put me in jail for the night, saying that I was reckless driving and driving without a license and failure to present. The third time, um, I got picked up by Miss, um, oh, sorry, I forgot her name. Uh, <laughs> But uh, Diana Stotts, uh, we got picked up and she took me to the first meeting. It was kind of scary at the beginning because there was all five different gangs in one room and you did not know what to expect. You know, when I got there, I found out what it was all about. And there's a lot of temptations that you have to fight 
when you are in a gang and or trying to get out. Because there's two type of gang members. One gang member that has a reputation and the other ones that's out to get a reputation. And the newcomers are the most dangerous ones, the little looks. The veterans, they know, they have a reputation and nobody talks to them. They come to them for advice. And 90% of the time, these veterans from gangs want them to get out. One, one example is Roderick Serrano, which has joined Washington County. I have met with him a couple of times, and every time that I talk to him, it's like talking to several types of my personality. You know, he's, he knows what it is going through, getting out, and being in a gang. Well, once in the program, I was, I didn't know what to expect. One of my greatest fears, and I think everybody, probably 50% of the, of the persons in here, is probably facing themselves. Because I believe there's no greater match than yourself. Because that you know what you think, you know how far you could push yourself. And that's what I was afraid of. Because I know how far I could push myself before, but I didn't know what to expect. You know, I was always tempted every day you know, that, you know, something was going to happen with the other photographers because there's everybody that's in the gang or trying to get out, like I said, they have a reputation to live by. And a lot of people, 90% of the time, they're sure fused. You, one, one of the things that I have seen that a lot of people do, and it's a big mistake, when they see a, a gang member or somebody that looks like a gang member, they stir them up and down. But see, we have to change that. What we should do is, you should become, instead of you know, moving away or looking away, the first thing you do is say hi or you know, you know, how you doing or anything. For it, always be the first one to talk. Why? Because that brings, that, that basis, you know, a relationship that can start beyond and beyond. You know, I mean, if you want to help out, I mean, you should be able to reach out first. I mean, there's a lot of people that are there and you know, they're, they don't know what to do, they're so confused. You know, should I get out of the gang? How do I do it? You know, but people are gonna be after me because of my reputation. I mean, I know so many people around me today that every time a fight is about to break up, I'm stuck in the middle of it. You know, like last night, you know, just my a couple of friends were about to get in a fight and I was stuck in the middle of it. Two different rival gangs and t both of them were my friends. And they know I'm, I'm not in a gang anymore and I'm trying to go straight and they respect that at least. But that's one of the things we have to, you know, work on. We have to build a, a relationship with everybody, period. Not only just gang members, but also, you know, people that are still stuck in the 60s. Everybody goes, you know, this is weird, <laughs> you know? But, I mean, everybody in, in general should, I mean, stir people down, that's, that's, not, that's not the part, you know, that's not the way to confront it. I mean, it's, it's like being a mime. You know, you, all you do is movement, but you never talk. How can you think? You know, how can you know what's in your mind if you're not going to come out and say anything? Well, <clears throat> you know, well, I overcame a lot um, being in this program. You know, I knew I could learn more. You know, I was like, um, you know, I got, a, I got a rush out of working with my mentor, Sharon Harper. She, you know, she pumped me up. I mean, it was funny, though. She yelled at me twice, and she apologized right on the spot. She goes, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to yell. <laughs> well, you're my teacher. You know, I mean, I'm learning from you. I mean, you're taking your sweet time to, you know, come, you know, somebody that you didn't even know existed, and, and you're reaching out. You know, I go, don't worry, you know, I, say, I, I used to say that, you know, don't, don't worry, just go ahead, you know. Go, no, you're not supposed to do that. Go, oh, okay. <laughs> She's like, I'm sorry I yelled, you know. But I mean, we're, we're there. I mean, there's a lot, of, like I said, there's a lot of guys and girls that are looking for help, but they're afraid. And I don't know, it's just, taking the pictures with, you know, different gang members, it was a real rush. You know, we compared, you know, it's like, where did you take this? And, you know, it's, I don't know, it just keeps, you know, pumping and pumping as you go on, you know, because you learn something every, in every session, you learn something. You know, even though if you miss one session, you know, you, the next time you go there, it's like, you know, what the, what the hell did I miss? You know, I, they, well, we learned this last week. Well, you know, then you learn it again, you know, you go, oh, you know, you, I, actually, I, I, Thursday nights were, you know, empty for me. All I did was sit around, you know, watch TV, you know, and I used to joke around with a lot of, you know, the, uh, the mentors and the photographers. I go, man, we could be watching The Simpsons right now or something, you know, Thursday nights. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
Uh, actually, I started looking forward for the Thursday nights, and you know, when after the program was finished, um, Thursday nights were, I mean, not the same. You know, there was something missing. And I, I strongly believe in this program. You know, everybody that gives time. I mean, one, one thing I'm, you know, they say, well, what advice, somebody asked me, what advice can you give me, uh, you know, to do this? All you have to do is have a lot of patience. Because a lot of these gang members that are currently involved or trying to get out have been neglected by their families or, you know, in many different ways. So they look towards friends. And, you know, when they see upper class people, like I said, you know, when you stare up and down, just turn your back instead of, you know, saying hello or how you doing, you know, they're afraid. They don't know what to expect like I did. I didn't know what to expect out of this um, program. And that, I think that's the most important thing that one should have, you know, if um, they, they want to work with any type of person, persons, uh, should be have a lot of patience. And I would just like to thank, you know, the Portland Club for giving this issue a hearing. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Robert Monterosa. Um, my name is Rita Trevino Flynn, and I am the communications manager for the Children and Youth Commission. Uh, the State Commission, and um, with Eric, we kind of hatched this idea, and I'm just going to say that as, the, as our presentation goes on, we're going to show you how many more people were involved and we could not have done without them. Um, and one thing that this whole project brings to mind is, is what can happen when a couple of state bureaucrats end up in the same room talking about an issue with somebody like Eric Fishman? Uh, because left to our own devices, uh, looking at the issue of gang-affected uh, gang and gang-involved youth, you know, we could have come up with another report or uh, maybe some flyers or something like that. But something more was possible to happen um, with a little bit of uh, creative thought, and I give much credence to Mr. Fishman for that. Um, we went into this project knowing that the number of youth that we were going to be able to involve the first year were nowhere near enough, and it broke our hearts throughout the project. We recruited about 25 youth from Multnomah, Clackamas, and Washington counties. The Tri-County area was selected because there has been such, um, there has been a very big growth in gang involvement and gang-affected youth issues in those three counties. Almost, um, I would say all three of the local children and youth commissions have been dealing with those issues either through funding, uh, through having uh, community action planning, uh, the establishment of task forces. So we wanted to go ahead and take a very small amount of money we had for public education on juvenile crime, and I think that we got a really great bang for the buck on this one. Um, which is not to say that for all the miracles that did happen, and there were some miracles, because after all, it was a couple of bureaucrats like myself sitting around with Eric talking about what can we do on the gang issue, what can we do on the gang issue, and it came out, well, let's get some gang kids together and they can take photos and we'll teach them how to use cameras and they'll go out and they'll take pictures of their own lives and then those pictures will be so good they'll go on exhibit at the Portland Art Museum. Well, that kind of thing just seemed totally impossible to us, and at every kick along the way, people were going, you can't do that, you can't do that, you just, that's, it's never been done, it can't be done. And at every step along the way, the people who started to come on board said, well, let's do it anyway. Let's do it anyway. And everything that came up that was an obstacle was let's do it anyway. Because there were a number of obstacles, as you can imagine, when you're dealing with gang-affected, gang-involved youth. Um, and there was a certain level of perseverance in this project that I have not seen um, that had to be maintained that is not always applicable in other ones. Um, for instance, when we first started the class and we'd done the recruitment, one of the uh, young people who was recruited, very gifted, very interested, gung-ho, attempted suicide and was in the hospital for two weeks. And then, you know, we were all shaken up and she got out of the hospital and she came back to the project and she completed it. Robert was not the only one to spend uh, some time visiting uh, with local juvenile officials during the course of this uh, project. We had four others who spent time going in and out of detention facilities or jails. You know, and at every time we're going, oh, oh, this is, this is just not so great, this is not so great. But then, so what? They came back. We had two young people whose um, 
basically, well, one youth in particular whose parents pulled him from the project. This was a gang-affected um, skinhead related, and the parent uh, father especially did not want the youth participating with other um, people, um, and it was basically a racially biased issue. Um, and we had one youth who participated and is an exquisite photographer and who does not to this day, I believe, know that his work was on exhibit at the Portland Art Museum because his home was subjected to 26 bullet holes, and when that happened, he and the rest of the occupants packed up and moved out of the state. So we were dealing with a very different um, kind of um, population here in some respects. And yet, you know, people see the exhibit, and we have eight of 40 sh photos here on exhibit for you to see today. People saw the exhibit, and on the opening night at the Portland Art Museum, people came and said to me, you know, this is just great stuff. I can't believe that these kids could have turned this stuff out in 13 weeks, essentially. And um, it was just like this. It was just like that with the whole project, that wherever there was something impossible, it suddenly somehow became possible. And the quality of their artwork and the quality of their images is just absolutely, I mean, I, I think every time I think about it and look at those pictures, I just consider it such a privilege to have worked on this particular project. Um, straight shooting is a microcosm of a successful partnership, a kind of partnership we at the State Commission are profoundly interested in because it benefits youth. Um, to just give you the, the broad parameters, one of the key ingredients in the successful partnership was the involvement of regular folks. Uh, Twenty professional photographers bellied up to the bar to work um, hand to hand, eye to eye, knee to knee, elbow to elbow with these kids and the mentors in this project were just astounding. They spent hours and hours and went way above and beyond the call of duty in the 13 week curriculum that was offered. Not only teaching the youth how to use the cameras and all of the technical aspects but and the design and the artistic side of it, but befriending them, um, providing them with rides, relationships were created, getting them out of trouble. It just really, re um, it was a sort of a restatement to me of how much individuals do and want and are willing and capable of making a difference in the life of a young person. There's no doubt about it. We also were blessed, um, as was stated earlier, with some uh, wonderful check writers. The Portland Trailblazers came in just in the nick of time. We had to buy the cameras. We had to pay for certain expenses like that. So we were very grateful for them uh, and their participation. Uh, Portland Community College was presented with this idea and just threw open their arms. They provided the 13-week curriculum. They provided the developing uh, facility, the developing um, chemicals, the um, paper, and a wonderful instructor named Richard Kraft, who was the essence of patience and flexibility. Because again, you know, when Robert says he didn't know what to expect, this was the first time any of us had ever done this, and nobody knew what to expect. Um, and then also the Portland Art Museum, you know, this was like a dream. This was a dream we, when we were going, oh, maybe the Portland Art Museum. And we were thinking, no, they, what? They, you know, these are untested kids. It's never been done before. And the Portland Art Museum, and especially I would say Terry Totemeyer, who's here today, um, was wise enough to see that this had some real possibilities and gave these young people a forum that will, to many of them, it was a defining mark in their life. And that's very, very important. Um, I think that most of the sponsors have been mentioned. Um, I just want to also say that we recruited youth in cooperation with the Clackamas County Juvenile Department, uh, the Washington County Juvenile Department, the Urban League and Youth Gangs Outreach of Portland. Um, the initial seed money, just to give you the parameters, was provided with a very small grant from the U.S. Justice Department for public education in juvenile crime issues. So this fit really perfectly. And as I said, it was not another boring bureaucratic report. And um, the organization for it, a great amount of the organization, uh, including transportation for the youth and hands-on, down in the trenches fundraising, came from um, some of our uh, Youth Service Commission members in Washington and Clackamas counties, who just went ahead and did it, sent out proposals and met with people and talked and tried to get the funding for it. What attracted all these wonderful partners, because these kinds of partnerships need to be in place again and again for our young people. Um, Eric's going to get into the details, because he's an artist at, at figuring out what attracts successful partners. Um, 
I will say that uh, along with what Eric's going to talk about, there are these ideas. First of all, it was a good idea, albeit one we stole. Uh, we stole it from Denver, sort of. They had done a project with youth, uh, homeless youth, and one mentor, but we, um, we t thought to expand it and involve gang-affected youth. And also, I think it was a very compelling issue that needs our attention. And the people that we talked to all came to understand that these young people need our attention. Uh, they understood that. And that these young people will get our attention one way or the other. Now, do we want them to get our attention in uh, gang-related incidents at Lloyd Center? Or are we going to give them a fine quality of attention that they really need? Uh, and a lot of people saw the need for that and partnered with us and, um, and I think contributed tremendous to the success of this. Among our goals um, were to provide gang-affected or gang-involved youth with a powerful and empowering learning experience, to cultivate a mentor-protege relationship and provide positive role models, to increase our community's awareness of the issues facing these young people. And what we came to understand, and I think I speak for almost everyone who worked with this project, is that these young people have been dealt a hand to play that not all of us have been dealt. And there are some differences. Uh, and there was a pursuit of understanding. Um, and this understanding took place at many different levels, from the personal relationships that were developed to a wider community, to the people who've seen the show in the exhibit. And look where we are today talking about this. So from that perspective, it's been really great. Because of the emphasis on what I, I think was the major thing involved in this, the sense of human understanding, um, for the youth, I think that many of them came to understand what Eric, uh, what Eric bandied around and we all said would be one attraction for the youth, that there is something cooler than being in a gang. Okay, What could that be? Um, what we came to find out was that it was the taste of accomplishment, um, the cultivation of a new interest, that's cooler than being in a gang. Seeing that there's a wider world out there, that's cooler than being in a gang. And that it always doesn't always have to be as it's been. Okay? It really doesn't always have to be as it's been. Um, what is cooler than a gang? Taking wonderful, wonderful images. Seeing your work on display at the Portland Art Museum. Being at an exhibit where the governor asks for your autograph, and so do others. Looking into the eyes of those who have seen your work and seeing back respect, okay? Respect and admiration. And on the night of the opening, that sense of respect and admiration for the work that these young people produced was absolutely palpable. What of those of us who came into contact with these young people? Uh, by working on the project with them, uh, by viewing the exhibit, by being connected in some way, what about our understanding? Well, what I began to hear were an, a large number of questions. What really do we know about these young people and their circumstances and their lives, other than what we see on the front page of the Metro section or the early evening news when there's something bad that happened? What really do we know of the hand that they've been dealt? And as it went on, there were more questions. If dealt the same hands, would we be able to play them any differently? And then when the pictures started to come in, we got to see some new kinds of things that I think also enhanced our understanding. Because what we began to see were images by youth who are so often thought of as being nothing but bad, nothing but trouble. And what did their photos show? Yes. Uh, some of the ugliness in the world around us, some of the pathos, some of the inappropriate activity, yes. And yes, some sorrow. And yes, too, some beauty and some wonder, innocence, timelessness, poetry, immediacy, honesty, directness, openness, and trust. There's a lot of trust in their photos the real stuff of life, the stuff that binds us all together. 
More than one person at the uh, exhibit opening night came up to me and said, you know, they couldn't really believe that these were the pictures of gang kids. I mean, some of the kids that are in, were in this project are considered dangerous. They can be. They are dangerous at times. And yet their pictures said, spoke to something else in them. Um, and people were talking about, you know, how these pictures were so loving. And they showed so many family and friends and dear ones. So I think overall, understanding, human understanding for those connected with this and those who see the exhibit and will see the exhibit was enhanced a great deal. At least that's my hope. The kind of organizing of this exhibit, this project, is something that needs to be done more. More of it needs to be done and it is being done more often. The commission that I work for is all about that. We are the offspring of the children's agenda, which uh, if you might remember was much talked about in 1989. Uh, when Neil Goldschmidt was still in office in the governor's um, job in uh, Salem. In 1989, uh, the Children's Agenda set up legislation that created 36 youth service commissions, one in each county. In just three short years, there has been an enormous amount of activity to put in place commissions that can meet the statutory requirements to start receiving state and federal funds and to put all of this at the community level to begin to plan and take care of our children at the community level. In the last three years, 7,000 volunteers have been uh, participating in this process. It's been one of the great best kept secrets in Oregon, and I hope it's not kept too much of a secret anymore. They work with a very small amount of mo money relatively, uh, $25 million in state general funds and about $2 million in federal funds for cr juvenile crime prevention. Of that money, almost twice as much has been leveraged in support of youth programs generated by that state money. Uh, the projects are aimed at youth employment, teen pregnancy, child care, curbing child abuse, homelessness, dropouts, poverty, and juvenile crime. Attention has been given, much attention lately, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Children's Care Team report in Salem, uh, which is expected, we don't know, depending on which way the wind's blowing today in the legislature, whether or not that is going to actually convert into legislation and whether or not it's going to be meaningful legislation. But the Children's Care Team basically has some ideas that are very similar to what has already been put in place here. The idea of communities coming together in partnership for their own children, picking up uh, picking, this whole idea is picking up steam. There are a couple of ideas that we have found from experience that are fueling, fueling this. First of all, is the knowledge certain that not all wisdom in this particular field emanates from Salem? That given the opportunity, given the resources, people in their own communities are perfectly capable and willing and happy to go through what it takes to provide for the children in their own community. And yes, they may even know what their needs are, more than what everybody knows in Salem. And I don't mean to say this to trash people in Salem because I'm one of them. And there are some wonderful, wonderful people working for children in the city of Salem and in government. But there has to be this other component in place too, and we need to, to value it and support it. Um, also, as I said, and it's again proved out with this particular project, regular folks empowered with the necessary resources are able and willing to tend to the needs of children and youth in their communities. The need for that is becoming more clear and more urgent. Then another component that's factoring into this that we have to account for is that the check is not necessarily in the mail anymore. And it is getting to the point where only the most severe cases and the most pressing, pressing needs of children are going to be the ones that get government funding. I mean, that's the way it looks like it's going. So what are we going to do? Are we going to turn our backs and not pay any attention to this? Or are we going to begin to build creative partnerships with more people coming up to provide what's needed? Um, Many, beginning, many are beginning to understand also, and I think in working with the commissions, that the needs of children are requiring urgent attention. Our families are under great stress and the children in them are the products of great stress. One in four Oregon children are classified at risk, and many of us in the commissions begin to see the need to extend the embrace to children under not just the ones under our own roofs, although heaven knows we need to pay attention to that, but also to the children who need us down the road, in our own communities, in our own neighborhoods, that we need to start to extend the embrace. 
Uh, the Commission's motto is fittingly applied to that, that is that all children are our children. Beyond this exhibit, there are countless other examples of how this is being done and how it's been done in the course of three years. I'm going to just take us very quickly um, to, um, to one project that, that took place in Pendleton. Um, I will say that it cannot happen unless local people have the resources to do what we're talking about. For instance, in this project, the organizing committee of lay, lay people just regular folks who are interested in children and youth issues, underwent fundraising training from Eric, who taught, you know, it's kind of a terrifying thing to have to go out there and ask for money if you've never done it before. And they went about the task of learning how to do that, how to present a proposal, and did it. And um, that's some of the kind of training I'm talking about. Um, out in Pendleton, our local commission formed a partnership with J.R. Simplot, which is one of the largest employees in that region. Uh, the company was starting to find that many of their employees simply couldn't come to work anymore because they didn't have adequate child care in their area. So what they did, that was definitely a children and youth issue. They came to the local commission. Uh, the commission said, let's start to try to put together some partnerships. J.R. Simplot donated the, the space. Uh, the Commission worked to get Head Start programs and Great Start programs and had a little bit of federal money with early childhood um, block grant money available. And so a very wonderful child care center was put together out there that has become something of an example to other employers in the region. The State Commission is involved through its local commissions in funding and participating with 450 programs serving children and youth. So I'm just going to show you that there are other examples, many fine examples beyond this one. But this one is also a wonderful example of what can happen when people come together. Um, also, one of the things that I think we need to begin to foster that don't cost a whole lot of money our mentorship programs, direct one-on-one -on -one programs like we saw with this one where we had the professional mentorships involved. Another one that is exemplified through the commission is um, the CASAs, Court Appointed Special Advocates. This is individuals trained to work with children who are or have been, who have been victims of abuse or neglect. Um, so we begin to see that there, this kind of stew is boiling. It is going to come about. It's like we can't stop it anyway, so we may as well try to understand it, learn it, learn it, and work with it. When we begin to look at results with this particular project, I know early on we were kind to think about, well, what will the results be? And Eric's going to talk about some very practical business things that go into play when you're trying to build partnerships, and I'm supportive completely. However, when you're also working with children who have had uh, strange hands played to them, results take on a very different character. And so are we looking for results that are going to last a lifetime? I can't tell you. You know, Are there going to be some miraculous turnarounds in, in the lives of these young people? Some of them have been offered jobs. Some of them have new opportunities available to them. Maybe. You know, but what are the results long term? I can't say. And sometimes when working with at-risk youth, um, I say that, yeah, results are important. Benchmarks are very, very necessary. And the state of Oregon has them in place as a way of tracking accountability and responsibility. And yes, that's very important. But sometimes things need to be done just because they need to be done. Sometimes things need to be tended to just because they need to be tended to. And attention needs to be given just because it needs to be given. And that has to be valued as well, and it was valued in this particular role, in this particular project. As for the role of those of us who find ourselves in the strange position of being policy wonks or planners or government types, increasingly the role is this, to give regular folks, people in communities, whatever we can with respect to training and resources and then get out of their way and let them do the job. And I think when we saw the way the mentors handled this particular project, getting out of their way was the only sane thing to do. And they did a beautiful, beautiful job. Um, so that is some of what was at play. There are a couple of people I want to take this opportunity to thank. One is uh, three people who are not here who worked very closely with me on this. One is John Ball, my boss, who let us do this, and this is kind of a strange thing for a government project. And also Steve Nelson, who worked with me um, and is regional coordinator in this area for the State Commission, and Jeff Nunn, who works with me, and it's, it's very, very wonderful to work with. And they all worked very long and hard hours and were among the people saying, let's just do it anyway, just do it anyway. Also, in um, our 
company today is Terry Totemeyer with the Portland Art Museum, to whom we are very, very grateful because he demonstrated a great amount of courage and wisdom, as far as I'm concerned, in accepting this at the Art Museum. Uh, Mary Souther Wyatt is with us, who is chair of the State Commission, and she was a big backer of this particular program, and her support in this and many, many other efforts has, has been absolutely wonderful. Steve Fulmer is with us, who was with us early on at the drawing board level from Multnomah County. I think I saw Steve from the Multnomah County Youth Commission. Uh, Diana Stotts, who is from Washington County and is the executive director of the Washington County Youth Service Commission. And she's the person that Robert was saying was always picking him up to take him to this uh, particular project. And um, Sharon Harper, who was Robert Monterosa's uh, mentor, is with us today. And um, to all of those and many, many other wonderful people who participated, my extreme thanks. I'm going to get off quickly. I've probably gone way beyond my time. Oh, my God, I have. Um, but I just want to end with one little quote, and that is, um, with respect to understanding, Stacy Hedges uh, wrote, most of us were asked to do this because of something we had done in the past that was negative. For me, it was a chance to get something positive out of it and to show people that change is always possible. Thank you. Well, you're in luck. The City Club ends in a couple of minutes, so uh, <laughs> you're going to have to uh, skip my, my speech and uh, we'll move on to questions. Thank you. <laughs> Um, actually, what I was asked to talk about a little bit is going beyond this particular program and how public-private partnerships are developed and how all of us can continue to work on creating these partnerships for the benefit of our community. And I will do that very briefly so we can hopefully have some time for questions. Um, I'm not going to go into this particular project because we've already, I think, all heard about the partners in this project. What was key in starting this or any other partnership is starting out with the mission. Why are we doing something? What do we hope to achieve? What issue are we dealing with? In this instance, it, w it started with a nugget being we want to make a broader awareness in the community about the issues that face gang-affected and gang-involved youth. Um, but the issue could be child abuse, the issue could be homelessness, the issue could be funding for the arts. Our community has many, many needs. And children and youth are, are a very high priority as far as those needs are concerned. But when you start to do a project, you have a reason, you have a goal, you have a why. And if you can articulate what that is, uh, then you have a starting ground to go from. And so what I always encourage is any group, and a partnership can be initiated from any end. In this instance, it was a government organization, a public sector organization. Often it's a, a private nonprofit organization, such as the Art Museum being the initiator. Sometimes it's a private citizen or a business, such as in the Smart Literacy Program, that can start a partnership and say there's something that needs to be done in this community. And when that initiating individual or group starts out and can articulate their mission, that then gives them something to go on to move towards the great idea. I'm talking about what tool are we going to use, what method are we going to use to achieve this goal. In the instance of straight shooting, what we were looking at is instead of doing a brochure or another television PSA campaign that may or may not get played in the middle of the night, who better to tell the story and to talk about the issues that are faced by gang-affected youth than gang-affected youth. And looking around at what mediums and what tools were available, art seemed to be a very, very powerful medium because it provides an amplification. It, and that's what this program was about, was amplifying voices that aren't often heard and utilizing partners in the community. A partner we haven't talked about is the media. And literally thousands of people probably saw the exhibit, but hundreds of thousands of people saw the photos and read about the photos and heard about it because we had wonderful partnership from all the local media. The Argonian, Willamette Week, various television stations and radio stations that help bring this out to a much broader audience. And that's an important tool that we have in our community that we can utilize. Um, so determining the type of project with that initial group, coming up with that idea, to make it a reality from an idea, it's important to put some meat on the bones, to create a project description. And I urge any group that's doing a partnership program to do that without ego. Assume that it's going to change. Assume that what you're going to come up with is enough of an idea so when you go and explain it to somebody, they don't think you're crazy. And when you explain it to somebody, they can kind of get a picture. With this project, it was, we want to do a program where we're going to get cameras into the hands of youth, match them with professional photographers as mentors, and get those photos shown someplace so that people will see them and hopefully have it be interesting enough that the media will pick up on it. And that was the nugget of the idea. And we were able to take that idea and then go to folks who were potential partners and realize that that idea was going to change. And to develop partnerships 
partnerships have to do with investment and with ownership and that it was Portland Community College and the Portland Art Museum coming on board and not just rubber stamping something but saying okay now let's help you make this better and let's work with you on what is a realistic time frame to get an exhibit up and let's work with you on how what's a realistic time frame on teaching people to develop photographs and every partnership program I've ever worked on has that as the key component to the success is that you bring partners on as partners not merely as sponsors and so that is critical that at that initial stage you have a description that can create understanding but that you have the flexibility to change it and to utilize the resources and the knowledge of the partners. Uh, once you've got that description, the very next thing you need to do, in my opinion, before you talk to partners is figure out your baseline resources that you need. We knew we needed cameras, film, developing supplies, a place to show the exhibit. For the smart literacy program, they needed books, they needed mentors to go into the schools, they needed schools to agree to host the program. For Stand Up Portland, we needed volunteers, we needed hats, we needed television stations to be willing to show diversity information. You have specific resources. Some of those are financial, some of those are time, some of them are knowledge and uh, abilities and if you can outline those resources then you're going to know what to ask for because if you go in and just say well we'd like your help somebody who could potentially give you all the dark rooms and all the film and all the developing supplies and an instructor which is what PCC did is to do a lot more than say sure we'll let you borrow one of our classrooms once a week which was what we you know we were originally saying well maybe we could get a classroom from PCC and instead we went in and said what can you do for us um, so identifying those resources and then identifying who are the potential investors? Who are the folks that have a mutual win-win benefit on this? And if you look at the people that played ball with us on this project, they all were organizations that did this because it met their mission. The Art Museum is an organization that has a strong mission in bringing the visual arts to folks and the performing arts and various arts but they also have a strong educational mission. And the Art Museum, particularly in recent years, has been really focusing on broadening their audience and on really being a resource to the broader community. And this was a program that helped the Art Museum to do that, and it met with goals that the museum had. Portland Community College is a community-based educational organization that sees what they do, the product that they produce, is a well-educated community and a workforce that has a sense of self-confidence and self-respect. And so this project tied in with their mission and their needs, and it was win-win for all the parties. The Portland Trailblazers are a group that are role models to youth in the community and are very concerned about making sure that they are a helpful component of our community and that they provide opportunities for youth in our community to succeed. And this tied in with their mission, and they are one of the organizations that has published guidelines for what they want to fund, which is a great way to start because you know what they're looking for. And we just went down the words, and they were all the right words, education, community investment, uh, involving multicultural programs. So that it was something that tied with that mission. So looking at who are the players that have what you need and what do you have that they need? And whenever we talk about developing partnerships, we aren't asking for a handout. We don't say, gee, wouldn't it be nice if you helped out this poor program? It'd be really wonderful for the community. We go and saying, we have a project that is important to the community. It's going to make a difference. And we are asking your organization to invest in this project, to be a partner in this project, and to bring to this project the talent and skills and resources that you have. And that's what all of us in this room have the ability to do as individuals, as business people, as public sector employees, as all of our organizations have resources. And when we see a need in the community, we can help tie our resources to the resources of others. In talking with the partners and developing that investment, it's also very important to us that we developed ownership, that the partners early on became invested by saying, here's a way that we can do this and make it better. Here's what we can bring. Uh, going beyond that ownership, the important thing to making a partnership successful in the end product, which as Rita pointed out in this instant, was not so definable as a certain number of photos or you know, a percentage increase in curriculum scores or anything of that nature, but had some broad brushstroke ideas like community education and public awareness of the issue. And if you look at the amount of coverage that this program generated, to buy that kind of coverage would have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it, we got wonderful exposure on it because the project had an integrity and was interesting and was honest. And the way that that ended up being successful was just like any other partnership, partnership is a business term, it had good planning. And any group that's doing a partnership program, whether you're a, a small nonprofit organization or a neighborhood that wants to do something about cleaning up a litter problem or a vandalism problem, if you're well organized and from the beginning set timelines and budgets and write down what your goals and objectives are and put in a component for evaluating your program and improving your program as you go, 
it's going to be met with a great deal of respect from the business community and from other public sector and private nonprofit organizations, and you're going to have something to use as a roadmap. So good planning and the ability to figure out kind of where were our cutoffs. You know, as Rita mentioned that the trailblazers came in just in the nick of time. We knew we had to have the cameras by a certain day. And so that really got us going on getting out there and getting the businesses to help fund the cameras because we had 20 youth showing up that Thursday night and we need cameras to put in their hands. Um, and having that, allowing the timeline to do that fundraising was real critical. Um, figuring out the kind of volunteer resources that were needed. Without the mentors, this never would have happened. And you can't put a dollar value to the time and energy that the mentors put into this program or that the thousands of volunteers across the state of Oregon put into making these programs work day in and day out throughout the state. And figuring out those volunteer resources early on and finding the people that are willing to come to the table and do that kind of work is, is really critical. And in doing so, that takes good planning because you know, you have to give people ample warning so they can clear their schedule. And you have to be able to let them know how many sessions are we talking about and when are they. We approached many photographers and got an incredible response. No one we approached said, I'm not interested. But we had to talk to about twice as many potential photographers as we ended up with due to scheduling. You know, asking someone to make a 13-week schedule is something that you have to give them time to, to look into. And finally, doing evaluation. You know, at the end of it, taking a look at what could be done better. Because certainly while this program was very successful, there are many components of it as a pilot project that we can improve upon. And we sought not only the feedback of the funders and the art museum and the community college and the mentors, but also the youth themselves, because who better to be able to talk about what worked and didn't work in the program. And as we look at other opportunities to, on where we go next with this, we're going to have a much better knowledge and be able to help other communities who have an interest in doing this sort of a program. So when you, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of, of how we, we develop a, a partnership. Um, when you look back on it and say why and say, you know, what, what is the reason for doing this and what are the successes of it, a great partnership is one where you've both had a program component. In this instance, you know, there, it was always this dilemma between, you know, are we doing this because it's a great educational and empowering experience or are we doing this so that we can get the word out to the broader community? And it wasn't an either or, it was both. It was meeting the program needs and being able to do something that was empowering to people, not only the youth in the program, but the mentors and all of us that worked on it and all the volunteers that went out and learned to fundraise and doing the project. Everybody got an empowering experience, but it also was a, a way of you creating a stepladder because the thousands of people that heard about it and saw the exhibit are going to be that much more likely the next time they hear something in, at a neighborhood uh, organization meeting about a gang committee being started or a task force being started to say, yeah, I think I'll volunteer for that because it's one more thing they've heard about in the community and there's that much more understanding. Um, so what I, well, I was asked to talk about how we can all continue to do these programs and projects and what I would encourage my fellow members of the club to do is all of us see every day of our lives the needs of our community. You don't have to go anywhere but just walk out the door of the Benson Hotel and we'll, we'll see them. And when you see something that needs help, no one else is going to take care of it. You, you need, we need to take care of it. And we all have the ability to do that. Often, it cannot happen alone. And of course, I, being a salesman, have to plug a great way that everyone can get involved in a partnership. And that's coming up very soon. We have the state's largest diversity campaign to date, which has been done by completely by volunteers and by public organizations, the city, the youth commission, uh, corporations such as Fred Meyer and the Argonian and Coin TV and KXL and Kissin, OPB's been involved, tons and tons of people, and that's the Stand Up Oregon diversity campaign. And if anyone wants to get involved in that, that kicks off and finalizes this August, and they still need volunteers, so I encourage anyone who's interested in getting involved in a huge public partnership to volunteer for that project. And uh, with that, I uh, leave the podium for questions. Thanks very much for that uh, broad and comprehensive view of the program. We have, we'll start with a couple of questions. First from Joanne Allen, and then from Sharon Fishman, and then we uh, would invite others to come to the microphone. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Ms. Mr. Monterosa, I have a question for you. Can you tell us how your life has been changed by participating in Shooting Straight, and what you see for yourself in the near and distant future? Well, actually, it had changed me a lot because um, I learned how to, you know, develop film, use a camera, which is something I thought I never was going to learn. You know, I messed, you know, with 35 millimeters, you know, there you go, you know, you're shot. But uh, it taught me a lot. 
You know, it taught me that I could work with also ex gang, you know, rival gangs and all. You know, after the, like I said, the first time I was there, you know, I looked around me and I saw five or six guys that, you know, two of them I fought before and three of them I almost fought, be, you know, before that. But then later on, we're laughing, go, man, you know, it's your picture, it's nothing to compare to mine, and you know, we're just having regular conversations. But it's it's funny because. Um, you know, I don't know, it's, I didn't expect, you know, never expected that it would turn out like this. And for my future, um, well, I have a three-year-old daughter and you know, that's all I can think of right now. You know, so I, I hardly see her because I don't want her to look at her father that, you know, well, he was all, uh, you know, was messing around all the time. But hopefully um, I have put, uh, I'm 22 right now, and by the time I'm 25, I want to have my own home and probably just have her with me at this time. That's all I can see in my future right now. Yeah. This program has spoken to so many different issues. Um, Sherry Fishman, City Club member. One of the things that has, has uh, touched me so much is the, the idea of, of validation. and. I have worked with youth all of my adult life as both a teacher and a counselor, and it was always my belief that every single person has the potential within them to do something of value and something creative. And it seems to me that this type of program has addressed that very basic need all of us have for fulfilling our potential and for validation. And what I heard you just say, Robert, was that you, you have undergone some change one of the other things that touched me about the program is is the human connection. And I heard you speak at the Art Museum also about wanting to have your community, the Mexican American community, viewed as people, not not as as a group with a stereotype. How did those of you participating in the program, and I'm addressing to this to everyone on the panel, how did you find yourself connecting with each other? Did you find the stereotypes of each other, the fears, the barriers breaking down, adult to young person, cross-racial, cross-gang? Did you start to see each other as people, as individuals? Did that change for all of you? Yeah, actually, for me it did. It was like a, a domino chase. Every time one fell, you know, there was always something to push you up. Know, and you know it keeps going like that little by little like I said nobody you know a lot of gang members don't know what to expect you know when they go into a room you know with people mm -hmm. they had never seen before only a couple of their buddies and you know this guy that they met probably you know at juvenile hall or you know in jail saying yeah you know I can help you out um, but you know like I said uh, it, it's really you know there's a lot of tension you know the first days but as you know as it keeps going on um, like I said, you know, you have to have a base to, you know, to build a relationship. And that base is the first thing is trust and a lot of patience. Because mm -hmm. you can never be, you know, rushing to anything. You, know, you always have to take your time, and I have learned that, you know, through the project. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Louis Simpson, and I'm with the Arts and Culture Standing Committee. And I, your, Robert, your story is tremendous. But I would like to ask uh, Rita or Eric, either one, uh, what is the motivation of the other persons who, are, who have been part of this program? Are they still motivated? Are they still connected with it? Are they still excited about it? I'll take a first hit real quickly that I know that some of the mentors that signed up with the youth are still, in, just still having, I mean, Sharon is here. Uh, she was Robert's mentor. Um, there have been opportunities. Some employment has come some some use way as a result, and the mentors have been asked to help them and assist in that, helping them to get these jobs taken care of. Um, so I think that there's a relationship like that that's been melded. I hope so. The other, quick, quickly, um, of the organizations that were involved in the program from the public sector and private sector, many of those organizations early on and again at the end of the program expressed a real interest in continuing to be involved in this sort of a program and actually we're all in the process of doing that evaluation and seeing where do we take this. 
Well, that sort of speaks to a question that I had. My name is Christella Byers. I'm a guest member here. Um, I was just wondering, because you had so much tremendous success with this program, are there any plans on repeating it or doing some other um, program in the future to help gang members? Well, first off, for anybody who hasn't seen the exhibit, the program is not completely over because a part of the desire was not only to do the exhibit at the Portland Art Museum, but then to have it travel into the various communities that represent the counties that the youth came out of. So the exhibit will be in Clackamas uh, at uh, Clackamas Town Center in October. September. And in September, and then we'll be in Washington County the following month. So um, there's definitely the opportunity to still see the, the exhibit. Um, and certainly there's a, quite a bit of discussion going on about what to do with this program because one of the nice things with this year's program is we developed a bank of cameras um, that, that are still there and able to be used. And we developed resources uh, by, the, by the various partners that came on board uh, and know where, where those resources lie. And so there's definitely, and many of the mentors have expressed interest in seeing this continue. And probably the most important thing, and that goes back to an earlier question about how did things all change, is at the end of the program, um, a lot of stereotypes broke down, particularly um, having youth that were in the program who initially um, you know, didn't show up frequently and uh, had definitely had a lot of um, not so positive experiences with government and with um, you know, organizations and institutions come up and say, you know, if you're doing this again or something like this, I'd like to volunteer to be one of the people that helps plan it. And uh, I think that makes a big difference. Well, I know you join me in thanking Robert Monterosa, Rita Trevino Flynn, and Eric Fishman. I think it's been a wonderful portfolio of helping us understand this program and the potential that it provides in and of it itself and for other examples. So uh, we're adjourned, but please join me in thanking our speakers today.